a welcome to the very second uh, Rural Women New Zealand Policy Summit webinar and this evening we are going to uh, talk about why vote. Uh, this is not about, um, you know, I think that there are probably quite a few people, I mean I'm, I'm sure someone will share the stats with us about how many people vote in New Zealand but, um, but you know, it's, it's really good to have a conversation that's not politically motivated or politically side um, uh, like a sidewinder or anything like that. So uh, hopefully we'll come out, um, the outcomes of this webinar will be that we learn some more about why we vote in New Zealand, we'll learn some more about democracies, how things happen in the world and how we fit into that, and also about women's participation and, um, you know, why it's really important to have women involved. So with us tonight, we have, firstly, we have the Rural Women New Zealand President, Fiona Gower, who's with us in the office um, from her home is at Port Waikato. Uh, we also have Charles Chevelle. Uh, kia ora Charles. Charles um, is joining us from Bangkok and he is the um, Global Inclusion and let me get this, uh, um, uh, lead, Global Inclusion Lead for the UNDP, United Nations Development Programme. Um, pleased to have you with us. Charles, and we have Prof Jen Curtin, who is, uh, teaches uh, politics at Auckland University and is also the um, head of the public policy school up there. And we have Alicia Wright, who is the chief executive of the Electoral Commission and also the commissioner. Um, so uh, kia ora to you. Uh, with Charles, and Charles will introduce um, Agata, who's with us from Poland. So we've got a very wide spread of uh, people joining us tonight, and I thank you very much. After the panellists do their presentation, we'll have five, which will be five to seven minutes each. We will have a Q&A session where people, if you can, um, the attendees, and welcome to you all, can put uh, questions in the Q&A or in the chat, and we'll monitor those and ask those of the panellists um, towards the end. And we hope to finish uh, about sort of 8.30, and so that we can, for those of us here in, in Wellington and those of us other places, have got other meetings to go to, and to spend time with family. We are recording this webinar and we will share it on the Rural Women New Zealand website. And once um, we have that, we'll let you know um, what that link is and we'll also be sharing that through uh, social media. Uh, all attendees, those of you who have been into webinars before, will know that um, you, your video and sound is turned off, but we will be able to communicate through you, with you through chat. And many thanks. And uh, first, I would like to ask Fiona if you could just share a little bit of our history and why we've put this webinar together. Yeah, uh, certainly. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. It's really great to be here with you. Thank you, Angela, and thank you the t for the team for putting this together. It's a really great opportunity to connect with you all and talk about why we're doing this. So uh, for many of you know that Rural Women New Zealand has been around since 1925 and we've been supporting and being the voice for women, their families and their rural communities in which they live. Women were the first people, first in the world in New Zealand to get the vote 127 years ago, and that's a pretty incredible thing. Our women that fought for that were real leaders. And we actually need to honour that and actually make sure that we do vote so that we honour what they did to get exercise our right to, vote, our right to vote. Excuse me. Women today are leaders and decision makers in their own right. And we need to respect that and make sure that they have a voice in everything that affects them. And we, without using that voice, we are no better off and the decisions are getting made for us. And often they can be quite adversely affecting us and what, how we live. We need, need to make a difference for our women today and for the future. Rural Women New Zealand is a respected voice and a trusted voice for our rural communities. And we do put out a man manifesto and that produces highlights of some of the issues that we feel are real priorities. So hopefully a lot of people have read those and seen what those priorities are. And a lot of it is about supporting our women and ensuring that they get that voice. So in 2018, there was a remit passed at our um, AGM to encourage more women to get involved and engaged in the voting of the election process. But to do that, they really do need to fully understand the process and how it works. Tonight is not about politics. It is not about parties. It is about that process. 
We're incredibly privileged to have the, the panelists that we have tonight. And I look at where you're from and I think, crikey, you know, Bangkok and Poland and wherever, it's, it's great to have you. I, Port Waikato doesn't sound very exotic at all. Uh, but it's good to be here in the office for the first time in quite a while in Wellington and it's great to be connected. We do realise that COVID has affected a lot of us in so many ways. And this is just another way that we can connect. And it's talking about using challenges and turning those challenges into opportunities. And these webinar series is a way that we've been able to do this. Um, so I think we'd like to um, introduce you. It's a very short part of what I'm doing tonight because we really want to hear more from our panelists and hear what they have to say. So kia ora, thank you very much for everybody that is attending our workshop tonight and listening online. We're looking forward to hearing some questions from you and hopefully getting some really great answers on why we should vote and how the whole process works so that we've got a really better understanding of why, why this will happen. So thank you and I'll hand back to Angela. Kia ora. Yeah, kia ora Fiona, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so next we have Alicia. So Alicia, would you like to um, share with us, you have to introduce the commission, the work that you do, how many people you're employing, because I've heard that recently, it's pretty impressive, um, for the, uh, and the mechanics, you know, all those sorts of things that we might need to know from a mechanical point of view, I guess. Uh, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you, and uh, kia ora everyone, and, uh, and isn't it wonderful that, um, that um, we're having the 126th anniversary of women's suffrage, and we were all excited because um, election day was going to be on suffrage day this year. Um, um, it's not going to happen now, um, it's going to be on a different date, and, it, and that's a good date too. Um, but um, it's wonderful that we can be here together to um, celebrate um, what is really an important, um, an important celebration. And, and today, um, I had the opportunity, um, um, we've got all of, our, all, all of our headquarters around the country, our election headquarters, and, we're, and we've selected all of our voting places. And so today I was in Christchurch, and I had the opportunity to go around and visit with um, our headquarters in different parts of Christchurch and to visit some of our voting places. And one of the voting places that I got to visit was, um, was it's gonna be our very first um, voting place in something called Adventure, Adventure Bike Barn. And it's an adventure trail in Christchurch. I don't know if you've been there. Uh, and um, we're going to have it up in the shop and it's going to be um, it's going to be there throughout that advanced voting period, and uh, and it gets about three and a half thousand people a uh, weekend a day during the weekends, and it's going to be an excellent um, way to reach out and have um, have a voting place where people work and live and have fun. And why I'm bringing that up is not only to talk about how cool that is but also just to reflect on um, what that means about our elections and our democracy. Um, and um, our elections and the way that they work um, are really focused on doing everything that we can to ensure that people have um, um, an easy way to enroll and vote. And um, we have advanced voting that lasts for several days. We have thousands of voting places across the country. Um, and, um, and we have services specific to different parts of the population as well. So part of what we provide are services for the deaf. We have services for those people who have poor health and mobility issues and are a aren't able to get to uh, voting place. We have dictation voting. And, um, and for some people, and uh, this might be really important for some people uh, on our panel tonight, we're even providing a service for people in managed isolation and quarantine. Um, and so this year we're going to be providing dictation voting um, for those people in there so that they have an opportunity to vote during the voting period. Um, so, um, so I'm not surprised, and none of us should be, um, that New Zealand was the very first place to, um, to give women the vote. Um, and we should be very proud of our democracy. Now, um, he, um, the commission 
Uh, our job is to run these things. We run um, parliamentary elections and bought referendums, and, um, and we maintain all the people who are on the roll. And for this year, um, voting is about to start, um, and this is our busiest time. There's no doubt about it. We've been really, really busy over the last little bit getting all of those things in place. Just so that you know, just to, just to, to stress the point, voting starts on the 3rd of October this year and it closes at 7 p.m. on Election Day, Saturday, 17 October. In the intervening period, on the weekend before, on the 10th and the 11th, we're also going to have a really big weekend. One of the things that we've done to address COVID is that we've extended the advanced voting period for a couple of days, and we've really increased the number of voting places during the advanced voting period. And we're having a really big weekend Oh, a little bit like a mini election weekend, the weekend before, and those are going to be in schools and community centers across the country. And that's all about it, um, doing everything we can to keep queues down, have people get in and out of the voting place as quickly as possible. Um, this year, um, um, so far we've had about 3.38 um, million people enrolled to vote. Um, and that's almost 90% of voters. So we expect that to go up um, at least um, 2 or 3% through voting. And what's really exciting is that we've seen a big jump up of our younger voters. So that's jumped up um, from 69% to 72% um, uh, over the writ day period. And that compares to 69% in 2017. So what we're seeing is a really big spike up this year um, in terms of the young people who are voting. And what we're hoping to see is that go up even further um, as um, we go through the voting period. One of the other things that we provide in New Zealand that is fairly unique to us as well, and I know it can happen in other countries, um, is that we enroll and vote at the same time. So if people aren't enrolled, they can go in, they can enroll and vote and do everything that they need to do at, one, um, at, uh, at the same time. And for the first time this election, they'll be able to enroll and vote on election day. They couldn't do that before. It had, it, they had to do it by Friday. Just getting into some of the mechanics of voting. So, um, and many of you will know this. When you walk into the voting place this year, it's going to be a little bit different because um, we have the referendum. So big. this is a big election in that regard as well. We've got the um, end of life choice referendum and the cannabis referendum. When you walk into the voting paper uh, place, you'll be given two voting papers, one for your ballot and one with the referendums. For the first is um, the voting paper for the election and that includes the party list, vote and your electorate vote. And um, one of the questions asked was around MMP. And just to be really clear, those two votes really are critical. People always say that the party vote is the most important vote um, between the electorate um, vote and the party vote. And just, and just to be, uh, and I know you all know this, but the party vote is all the lists of different registered parties. The electorate votes are the candidates who have put their hand up to represent that particular electorate. Um, the party vote determines the, the makeup of parliament. So if you think of um, the party vote, when, when it's all, um, all counted up as a big pie and it's broken into pieces, um, the pieces of the pie determine the number of seats in parliament. And if you have a party um, that has both electorate MPs and party votes, um, the electorate MPs are subtracted from the pie. Um, and that determines how the whole pie looks. Um, so when people talk about why it's really important to do your party vote, that's why. Um, for this year, the referendum papers, um, which you also will receive, will have the end of life choice um, referendum question first and the cannabis um, question second. And the way that we determine that, if you're interested, this is true mechanics, is um, we had to go to a high court judge and we took each of the questions and we um, 
One was on one question was one on one piece of paper and one question was on another piece of paper and we were folded them up equally and we weighed them so that they were exactly the same. Then we stuck them in a ballot box and I had to go pick one of the questions out and I happened to pick the end of life choice one first. So that's why that goes first on your ballot paper. Um, you'll fill those in, you put them in the ballot box just like you always do. Voting's gonna be a little bit different this year because of COVID and I've talked a little bit about that already. But what you'll see is we'll be in bigger voting places. We will be um, using physical distancing, hand sanitizer, contact tracing, and um, we want you to bring your own pen, but if you don't have a pen, we'll have one there for you. Um, and we have Ali lots Alicia. of pen. Am I out of time? Nearly, pretty much. All right, <laughs> okay. Um, Finally, I just want to talk a little bit about what we do to encourage per participation. We're out in the communities. We're doing everything we can to get people to enroll and vote. Um, and, um, and, um, and, and everybody should be encouraging everyone in their communities, their family, their, their young people in particular, to ensure that they enroll and they can enroll online and, and, and vote. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, um, Alicia. And of course, it is great to know, you know, so that we, we know what to expect um, when we want to go and cast our vote. Uh, and just a reminder, too, to those, uh, you know, to the attendees that you can uh, lodge questions. But now we shall um, move to uh, Prof. Jennifer Curtin. Uh, and Jennifer, if you would um, like to, you know, uh, let us know your thoughts on the um, democratic voting process and, and why it's important for us to vote, and women especially. Kia ora. Kia ora, Angela. Um, and I'd just like to thank Fiona and her colleagues at the Rural Women's Network for inviting me to participate uh, at this time in this very important um, discussion, I think. So Angela gave me three questions and um, I've sort of adapted them a little bit so that I can talk to, to what I'm passionate about in terms of not just what voting means, but um, why elections matter to women. And I think I'll be picking up a few of the themes that Fiona's already covered in her introduction. I would just add a personal um, anecdote here to pick up on what Alicia said about young people um, getting enrolled. So my 17-year-old son is one of the 6,000 soon-to-be new voters that get captured by the extension of the election date to October 17. So he turns 18 on October the 15th. And as soon as it was announced of the one-month extension, he got my husband to help him get online and find out how we could enroll to vote. Um, so that was pretty exciting um, for him. Uh, so yeah, I think I think there'll be quite a few that that might be re-energized or energized because because of this sort. Of, it's like a little Christmas present in advance, really, if you're if you're interested in politics and voting. So what I thought I'd do is, um, Lisa's covered a couple of things that that I wanted to mention about what MMP involves, and why it came about, and and what it means to have two votes. But but I'm not going to talk about the technicalities. I just I kind of want to talk about to pick up the theme about why voting matters, to, to talk a little bit about tactical voting. And so the thing about the two votes and what it enables is if you find yourself living in a safe, what we call a safe electorate, and you don't identify with the incumbent that holds the large majority in that electorate, it's often easy to think that your vote won't count. And, and that's what the old system did mean. Um, in, a, in many electorates that, that because it was just the winner takes all model, that there was a lot of wasted vote. Um, and what we call this efficacy, like that, that, our, that the participation means something to the individual that's doing it. And if people think their vote doesn't count, then it's a real deterrent to actual participation. And so, and so um, what, what the beauty of MMP is, is because we have this party vote, as well as our electorate vote, we can use that. All voters can use that to then choose um, a party that really appeals to them that might not otherwise um, be able to represent them through a solely through an electorate vote. So, so I think it's really important to remember that these two votes have 
very particular, like that that the electorate vote means something, but so does the party vote, and and that's what Alicia was talking about. So, and we're very privileged, I think, to think about the idea of having two votes um, rather than just one, even though in a sense it's still just one, right? Um, but what, what this tactical vote, a large number of New Zealand voters are in fact tactical voters in the sense that they split their vote. Um, they don't, even though the, the parties will appeal to you to two tick because they ideally want your party vote because as Alicia said, it, it's what determines the makeup of the parliament. Um, we know that voters care about having a check and balance on on political parties or the major parties, if you like, to allow for more deliberation, to, to ensure that there isn't hubris in policy making, and um, and just to to not end up. So our younger voters won't remember the time when we had first past the post. Some of us do, and lived through governments that were formed sometimes with less than forty percent of the vote, you know, in the thirties, but then ended up with you know, way more than 50% of the seats, which in a sense didn't seem particularly fair. So, so I think um, just want to reiterate that uh, while it's often the case that we hear about the tail wagging the dog, so the small parties controlling the large parties, this isn't really what's playing out. This is what MMP gives us is uh, most often, unless there's a lot of uh, votes for parties that don't meet the 5% threshold, um, most of the time we see governments being formed that capture 50% plus one minimum of the vote, if you like, in the way in which that coalition or support agreement is put together. So why then um, do elections matter to women? This is my second question. So first of all, I just want to put out there that women are not a homogenous group. We're a diverse group with different interests, different lived experiences, and different aspirations for ourselves and our families. That said, there's a theorist, political, feminist political theorist called Anne Phillips, who says that there is one thing that all women have in common, and that is to see more women from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, represented at the decision-making table in politics and in other sectors as well. So that, that's something we do all hold in common. And why? She says because it, even though we hear the policy messages um, from political parties during campaigns, actually very, there's still a lot of room for deliberation and you don't get fulsome deliberation and inclusive deliberation if you don't have diversity at the, at the decision making table and that's in politics. And so, so in this sense, we do have as women, um, whether, whether whatever community of women we come from, um, something in common in the sense of ensuring our polity is diverse in terms of its representation. It's also really important because we as voters, um, we might all vote differently, but if women turn out in large numbers, the political parties are more likely to listen to our arguments. Now the suffragists believe that winning the right to vote would see a significant policy, significant policy progress for women. They believe that if they collected the evidence and presented to their male representatives in parliament, that that would suffice. And some progress was made, but by the early 1910s, there was a real recognition that women needed the right to stand for election and be in the house to be impactful. So Angela's back on the screen. So this means I have two minutes, which means I'm like, okay, so um, I'm gonna jump ahead then. Uh, um, I just wanna put a wee plug in that this election, because of the way in which the COVID has taken over our lives and because of the various important policy decisions that are getting undertaken as a result of COVID, that having women at the decision-making table and present in those policy choices is even more important than it was before because this is a whole new landscape for our economic and social well-being. And there are real concerns amongst NGOs, women's NGOs and women activists around the country that actually women's voices are not being sufficiently well heard in this election and amongst the party's policies. And so the Gender Justice Collective has been working to collect 
the views of women and, and put out a scorecard that evaluates um, how the parties are addressing the range of concerns um, to women. So it will supplement nicely, Fiona, the, the, the priorities that Rural Women's Network has already done, um, offered. One final point I want to make is just some statistics about women as voters that might inspire you to, to think about you know, your vote and, how, and remind yourselves about how important it is. So what we know is that in 2017, so based on the New Zealand election study that I work on with scholars at Victoria University, in 2017, women's turnout rates increased by 7.5 um, percentage points according to our respondents. Okay, this isn't Alicia's data, this is our, amongst our responses. Um, this was higher than um, 2014, and that's really pleasing. Uh, we know that um, the there's been a gender, when women are leaders, then those um, parties do quite well with women voters. So this election will be really interesting to watch because we have two women leaders and so we will once again have a woman prime minister. And the other thing I think that's important to remember is that the New Zealand election study shows us or tells us that our resp women respondents prioritise policy issues, issues differently to their male counterparts. And so economic austerity particularly and expenditure on services to families and social services and so on is, tends to be more, high, um, more highly prioritised um, for women than for, um, for men in our study. And so we, we just kind of, I suppose, by voting in large numbers, remind our political parties that we're a constituency of importance despite or because of our diversity and that getting those voices heard is really important. So thank you, Angela. Thank you. Thank you, um, Prof. Jen Curtin. That's great um, to hear from you and about that study. That's, uh, that's you know, and the fact that it's ongoing. Um, <clears throat> we have a question uh, in the chat, which the panelists have seen, which I'll read out, which hopefully might be covered with the next um, presentation. How does New Zealand voting and participation in voting compare to other countries? So um, on that note, Charles, uh, welcome. Uh, Charles is, um, you know, works for the UNDP and I'll let you tell us a little bit about this, about um, Agata and, and your work that you do. Kia ora, Charles. Okay, thank you. Kia ora, uh, and thanks very much for the opportunity to say a few words. Um, First, perhaps I could just thank Fiona and Angela. Uh, I've known and worked with Rural Women New Zealand for a long time. Uh, I remember <clears throat> back in the old days when I was a member of parliament, um, one of the groups that we always paid very careful attention to uh, when we had a submission uh, from was Rural Women New Zealand because the um, we always knew that the entity came without an axe to grind uh, and would be presenting uh, to us on the basis of evidence, two very valuable um, propositions. And um, I think it's great that you're holding this seminar tonight. Uh, I hope that the uh, things that uh, we're discussing with your members will be useful to them. Um, Agata, my colleague and I uh, work for the United Nations Development Programme, the development arm of the UN. Uh, we really do three things at UNDP. One is um, working to promote livelihoods, uh, especially rural livelihoods in developing countries, uh, and especially for women and groups uh, most likely to be left behind uh, the development cycle. We also do environmental protection as part of that work, and we do good governance. We believe very strongly as part of our mandate that unless people uh, can ensure that they have inclusive, effective and accountable governance institutions at their disposal providing services to them, uh, then sustainable human development is a very difficult proposition uh, without those, uh, those institutions. And so the, the work that Agata and I do is largely centered around trying to build those institutions uh, in developing countries and to support them uh, as best we can. I've got a presentation um, I'm going to just uh, work with Agata on sharing it. Um, so 
really just starting at the basics. Why is voting important in democracies? Um, obviously, a democracy is a political system where all uh, citizens have the right to participate either directly or indirectly in the decisions that affect them. And electing our representatives is a cornerstone of democracy, really the most basic form of indirect participation. Through elections, we legitimise decision makers and hold them accountable for their performance in office. And it's really how we, um, we create the entity, the parliamentary entity to which uh, all those institutions that, that deliver services in the community, including ministers and members of parliament, ought to be accountable. Um, so, uh, whoops. <laughs> I think, uh, obviously, there are other forms of participation, campaigning, petitioning, protesting, interacting with elected representatives, joining political parties, uh, forming civil society organisations or grassroots movements, standing for office, serving if elected, uh, becoming involved in pressure groups, paying taxes. Uh, these are all forms of participation uh, that uh, I think go hand in hand with the democratic and elections process. I'd like to talk about uh, the phenomenon of the decline of trust because it's something that we confront on a daily basis in our work. The average voter turnout uh, has dropped by 10% across the globe since the 1990s. In New Zealand, it's down from 85.2% in 1990 to 79% uh, last year or last time in 2017. Uh, this is a, a reflection across the globe of a decline in trust in governments. Uh, governments are seen as incompetent, unethical, uh, and far behind media, business, and CSOs in terms of their trust factor. Too often, there's a feeling that there's been corporate capture uh, of the political parties, the major political parties, and that the interests of governments serve the few rather than the many. And this uh, perceived lack of trust has manifested around the globe, particularly in the last couple of years, uh, in the protest movement that we've seen in so many uh, different countries as diverse as the United States, Chile, uh, across the, uh, uh, many of the African jurisdictions, uh, in the uh, former Soviet Central Asian countries. Uh, you can see that that there's this common um, frustration with the, with the ordinary political process that's seen people uh, move out onto the streets. But why is it important to vote? Obviously, participation is linked to better governance, um, where people enjoy uh, more and more meaningful opportunities to have a say in how their society is governed the effectiveness and the legitimacy of governance and decision-making are higher. And I think, you know, it's, it's probably um, important to say that participation in clean elections of the sort that uh, New Zealand enjoys is not a given around the world. Uh, there are many uh, countries where uh, the right to vote is cherished, uh, but where it's not a straightforward matter. There might be barriers to get to the ballot box. There might be barriers to register as a, as a voter. There might be barriers to, um, you know, really, really see uh, a meaningful uh, level of participation in the entire process. And this is particularly the case uh, when it comes to women trying to vote. I remember uh, when we did the um, election participation survey after our assistance in Afghanistan. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna move my uh, chair because it started raining here. <laughs> I remember in Afghanistan um, being very humbled by uh, an encounter I had uh, with a woman who showed up. Uh, she just voted, she showed me her thumbprint She'd walked several miles to get to the ballot box, and she told me that she and many of the people in her village had been threatened. They were told by the Taliban that if they, they turned up and voted, there would be retribution against them and their families. 
But she said, you know, for years and years, we've been denied the ability to come along to the ballot box and participate. We're not going to be deterred. We're grateful that the United Nations is here to help uh, ensure our right to vote. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're here and we're very serious about it. And I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's an anecdote that, that I always remember when, it, when I think about how fortunate many other countries are when it comes to a simple and, and more straightforward participation system. This um, graph here just tries to place um, uh, some of the uh, participants in the democracy survey. And I think, you know, what we, try to, we, we try to see ourselves very much in the, in the top right-hand side, uh, where we um, have sceptical trust entity that, uh, that we're trying to, to put voting supervision in place for. Every vote clearly does matter and uh, really I think um, the lesson for me having worked in the UN for some time now, having come from a jurisdiction like New Zealand, uh, I don't want to indulge in cliches but you know we really don't know how lucky we are and I really hope we do cherish uh, the right to vote and continue to ensure that it flourishes. I, I want to hand over to Agatha now because she's going to conclude the presentation for UNDP with two specific uh, slides concerning women's participation. So Agatha, may I hand over to you now, please? Thanks, Charles. Sh should I switch to my screen sharing or can I use... Sure, can, I'll, can I'll use stop your now and let you, you start, yeah? Thank you. So, just to give you a bit of an overview of what women's participation around the world looks like. Uh, in many places around the world, we've exercised our, our right to vote quite actively and, and have been voting as much or even more than men. Uh, but this participation as voters hasn't necessarily translated into our participation as decision makers. Globally, we as, as women lag behind men as candidates for political parties, uh, sorry, candidates for office as members of political parties, but also as campaign activists or, or top civil servants. Um, around the world, less than one in four MPs um, is a woman. In New Zealand, the, the figure is obviously much higher. It's, uh, I think, at 41%. Um, and, and it's much lower for women heads of state and heads of government as just above 6%. So if the world continues at this pace, it will take another 46 years to reach gender parity in parliament and likely much longer for a woman head of state or, um, or a head of government to become the norm rather than the exception. So why is it important for women to vote even if um, equal representation in their country is nowhere in sight or if they feel like there is no one to really vote for. Well, my short answer would be because a gender equal society, a fair um, and, and, and more inclusive society, which is I think what most of us um, are, are after, is both about who makes decisions as it is about what kind of decisions we make and how we make them. So today, we understand that any given political decision, any given public policy impacts women and men differently. And this is a result of the different gender roles that we have in society. And, and with this in mind, to realize uh, gender equality, we need several things. We need policies that um, recognize and meet the different needs of women and girls. But we also need the kind of governance that creates equal opportunities for women of all backgrounds to shape and influence these decisions. And both as elected representatives, but also other actors who are in the room and are being consulted when important decisions are being made. And ensuring these should be the responsibility of all politicians and all political parties alike and whoever is voted into office, a woman or a man, a party A or a party B, must be equally accountable to women constituents for the decisions that they make. And like Jennifer said earlier, this is especially important now as virtually every country in the world sets off 
to build back from um, the the health and economic crisis that uh, the world over left women much worse off than men. So to wrap up, it is it is particularly important now um, for us as women to do our homework and and choose the representatives that we think are going to get us uh, the closest to where we want to be in a in a few years time and to show the elected representatives who they will answer to for the decisions that they make along the way. Thank you. Magic, thanks so much. Um, great to have the, uh, the, you know, the information from around the world. And that actually brings me to um, a Q and A, if you could just jump off um, and unshare, I can grab uh, the question. So there was a question here, how do you see New Zealanders voting behaviour comparing as a democracy with other countries? Like how do we compare here uh, in behaviour, I guess? Uh, Alicia might be able to answer that, or Prof Curtin with some of the work you've been doing, but probably Charles and Agatha might be best. So who would like to answer that first? I, I could have a little stab at, at making one observation, perhaps, um, deferring to Alicia's expertise, but um, one of the things that always strikes me about a country like New Zealand is the high enrolment rate, and I know that there's a huge amount of work that the Commission puts into ensuring that that's the case, that the electoral roll is credible and, and as inclusive and as comprehensive as possible. Um, and although, uh, you know, it, it, it is, in my view, a shame that along with other countries where there isn't compulsory voting, New Zealand's um, level of voting has declined in, in previous years. It will be really interesting to watch what the effect of the referendums will be in New Zealand. Um, I mean, without a clumsy stereotype, you know, you've got the cannabis referendum that, that may have an appeal to some young people. You've got the end-of-life legislation that may have particular appeal at the other end of the spectrum. Um, that plus the, I guess, the unprecedented level of um, post-COVID support for the, uh, for, the, for the current leadership, I think is going to be fascinating in terms of the way it drives turnout or not this time. And just to add to that, Charles, I think that drop, in, in voter turnout, it's been much lower in New Zealand than it was in, um, in other mature democracies. So I think only at 6% since the, the, the 1990s, whereas in, in other mature democracies around the world, it's been around 10%. And New Zealand stands out as one of the countries who have really managed to mobilize the, the, um, the young voters that you participate um, in elections, as opposed to many other countries like the UK or the US, for example, where changes to um, the voter registration rules have succeeded at uh, pushing many young people off, off, off the voters' lists. Can I just um, add a, a comment about the behavior of voters in New Zealand comparatively? I think prior to COVID, the thing that a lot of uh, voting behaviour academics and researchers were interested in it was the rise of the populist right um, and far right radical parties in Europe in particular, but also we can think of Brazil and we can think of the US um, and, and Brexit, for example, and the, the issues with, with the polls and whether or not the social democracy so centre-left parties and parties further to the left were in perennial decline. So we had voters turned off um, parties of, of the centre-left and, and how many of them were shifting to the far right or the radical right or the populist authoritarian right. And what, um, what so there's a book that just came out about two months ago that's edited by Jack Vowles and myself on and it's got a range of authors in there and the electoral commission helped fund the survey that we ran in 2017 and the book focuses on whether or not new zealand in 2017 was an exception to this populist 
phenomenon that we were seeing globally. So were New Zealanders as voters less likely to embrace this radical right populism? Um, and we, we, we've investigated this in some depth and, and we, while we don't dismiss the, 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 the possibility that we could end up looking like some European countries, the US or the UK, for example, um, at least in 2017, this populist phenomenon that we are seeing, have been seeing in other countries, was a very residual phenomenon in New Zealand. So if we're looking at actually what New Zealand voters look like, I would speculate and say that um, our median voter, so our middle voter, is, sits very much sort of in that broad centrist kind of position if we're thinking about a left-right scale. Thanks, Angela. Um, Alicia, would you like to add anything to that or comment? Yeah, yeah, no, I think um, I'm just picking up the issue around turnout. What we did see, um, we hit a really bad point um, in um, 2011 where the, the voter turnout really did plummet quite a lot. We've been digging, our, digging out from there ever since. And 2014, we saw an increase. In 2017, we saw um, uh, an increase again. So we, we were close to 80%, which took us to as high as it had been since 2005. That's all good. How turnout will be affected again by all of those different variables, including COVID, will be one of the big mysteries of the day. Uh, you know, it will, be, it will be fascinating to see what happens there. New Zealanders, I think, and, and, I, and we've seen this come through in um, the New Zealand um, voter survey that Jennifer and Jack have been working on, is most people consider themselves in New Zealand to be voters. Even if they don't actually vote, um, they vote, right? And, and, um, and the proportion of people who say that they vote and the actual people that vote don't quite line up um, um, right down the line, but the intention of voting is there. And, um, and the expectation that people will vote. I think good said. We do do quite for non, um, Charles talked about the fact that we don't have compulsory voting here. Um, and we're one of the highest countries in the world in terms of turnout rate for those countries that don't have compulsory voting. We often compare ourselves to Australia, which has a, um, um, which does have higher, compul um, which does have higher participation rates and does um, have compulsory voting. And you can see the difference um, there. Um, I think the other thing, and just picking up point that Charles and Agata have made, there is a high expectation of integrity and trust around elections in New Zealand. New Zealanders take this incredibly seriously. And I can speak from personal experience. We have one of those, um, and it's, it's quite a quirk of the system, where on election day, there is no advertising. There's no media. There's no nothing. People can walk into a voting place. Nobody can, can canvass them for votes. Um, there is no media allowed, no advertising allowed. Billboards have to come down. Everything has to stop. The number of phone calls that we receive from across the country when there's a billboard left up or a hoarding that hasn't been taken down, you don't want to know. Honest to God, the phone is going hot. Everybody takes this incredibly seriously. Um, well said, well said, and and um, and I think that's interesting. But um, Jennifer, just while I've got you, and just remembering, could you pop the name of the book in chat or in an email to us so we can share with others? You were talking about the book that you've written, um, or edited with you and Jack, and it's also free to download the whole book. So oh, wow. I'll put the website in there. You don't even have to buy it. Even better. Um, so, so there's another question. Um, it's, it's 20 past eight for those that are watching the clock. And yes, I was a timekeeper at a couple of conferences in a former life. Um, 
there's a question here. Can you help me better understand in simple terms, simple, <laughs> the differences between first past the post and MMP? Because people still seem to find it confusing and, you know, I guess some of the media still find it a little confusing or people do still find it confusing for some reason or another. So has anybody got any simple key messages as to the differences? I'll give it a go, Jennifer, and then Jennifer might want to give it a go as well. And uh, just just if I miss out a point, um, uh, basically the way it used to work was that there were just electorate MPs in every country, in every, um, and we had um, I don't know how many electorates we had, but we divided the country up into bits. And um, and there was one, and there was one MP. All the members of Parliament came together, and that was the way the system worked. What it meant was that um, the person that represented that electorate, um, if they um, got over 50% of the vote, um, they basically represented the entire electorate. Um, and, um, and that's the way all of the members of parliament were chosen. That means that, um, that people might feel really strongly about a minor party candidate, or they might feel really strongly about, um, um, uh, they might feel um, that their MP was not aligned to um, uh, policies that they felt strongly about, but if they happened to be in that electorate, that was it, that was, that was who represented them. Um, mixed member proportionality allows, um, um, minor parties to come in. It means that you have um, many voices that can be heard, and it means that you're not throwing away your vote if your vote happens to be in electorate MP that is a safe seat um, and is uh, definitely going to um, win that electorate MP role. Um, and so that's and that's allowed um, multiple parties to come in. And it means that they, um, as well as as well as being represented at an electorate level, and that's that's my take at it. Jennifer, you probably could do a better job. No, no, that's brilliant. I um, I suppose I would because I was typing at the same time. Did you talk about about the one seat threshold? Okay, so so yes, it's all about two votes and so on. But the reason, for example, why we have before this election had act in Parliament for even though they've only won two percent of the vote, for example, is because David Seymour wins the seat of Epsom, and when he does that, he gets to come in. But he also may, if he had three percent of the vote, bring at least one other MP with him because that party would still be allowed 3% of the seats. So, so there's a threshold of 5% if you don't win an electorate seat, and then there's an electorate seat way of getting in. Um, one other thing I would just say is that back in 2011, we had one of those marvelous things called a referendum on whether or not MMP was the, was the system for us. And there were a couple of questions that was a little bit confusing. Some of us were out there doing info talks about what the referendum was all about. But essentially voters had a, came down to a choice between going back to first past the post or, keep, or keeping MMP. And the government said that if MMP was kept, that they would undertake a review, an independent review of how MMP was operating. And um, the Electoral Commission, I think, was involved in this because that's how you get independent reviews separate from Parliament. And uh, a lot of people wrote submissions. Some of us requested that the one seat threshold be, uh, some, some folks asked for the one seat threshold like the Epsom seat be removed from the rules and that the threshold to get into Parliament be dropped to 4%. Um, because actually we've had quite a few small parties that have made 4.2 or 4.6. We can think of the Conservative Party. We can think about New Zealand First in the year that uh, Winston Peters didn't win back Tauranga. So, so the idea of uh, reducing what the, 
the threshold is for a party to get win representation was was recommended to be dropped to four percent. Um, interestingly, at the time, Judith Collins was Justice Minister, and after a one year of deliberation of this of this report, this independent report, um, responded in a question to, um, in Parliament saying that that the government of that at that time wouldn't be pursuing any changes to MMP like a reduction of the threshold. So I'll just leave it there. Okay, Charles, is there anything from your observations around that? I mean, not every democracy in the world has MMP or F F FPP, do they? I mean, I think what I would say, um, I'd certainly echo Alicia's observation that New Zealanders have this desire to vote and participate really built into their DNA. I remember a colleague of mine in Parliament laughing once about the, we were talking about a, a, a seat in the South Island, rural South Island, and he, he kind of made a slightly derogatory, well intended but derogatory joke about, you know, he said that if, 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 the, um, if somebody had sort of bulldozed uh, uh, some gravel in front of the, um, the polling station in this place, people would be you know, climbing over it in their Zimmer frames to overcome the obstacle. And that's absolutely true. I think um, it's been great to see the arrest and decline uh, in New Zealand. I think it is partly because MMP is a more inclusive system. I remember, you know, parliaments of old where um, numbers of women were much lower uh, under MMP. It's much easier for the political parties to um, get women into winnable positions through the list, as well as using um, special measures and electorates to uh, to see winnable seats won by women. Uh, this applies to other uh, groups who've been traditionally missing out. Uh, I mean, we have a much uh, more diverse parliament now in terms of Māori, Pacific representation, Asian New Zealanders, LGBTI people, people with disabilities. And this matters because, you know, the evidence shows that the more inclusive and the more representative you have a parliament, uh, the more seriously it's taken by the decision makers uh, to whom it's held accountable, and the more it looks like the rest of the um, of, 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 of the population. And when you combine that with, you know, a very active desire to participate in a civic way, um, and methods like, uh, you know, a, a select committee system that actively solicits involvement from civil society. Uh, on, on bills and petitions and, and matters before it. Uh, I mean, of course, you don't have a perfect democracy, but you have in many ways um, participation being taken much more seriously. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, I think, is the way that MMP has removed that elective dictatorship. Another reason is the, the fine work by the, the Commission. Another work is, is another reason is just because New Zealanders demand it. And uh, thank God for that. Thank you very much, and we are just um, near the end of our time, but what I'd like to offer, is there any of you would like to say, you know, do you have a final comment that you'd like to, to give us in this webinar? And, and then, um, going to, if, if I might ask you to, to close. Um, so I'll, I'll take a comment from each of you, actually, and then, um, and, then, and then I'll hand over to Fiona, if any of you have got a further comment to make. I don't mind going first if that's right. I just want to um, do a bit, just pick up on the COVID, post-COVID policy issue and do a bit of a plug for thinking about diversifying not just our parliament, but who gets to hold the finance portfolio. So I don't know if any of you, I'm really passionate about feminism and finance and politics now because Actually, the people with the power to make the economic decisions for our country are often not the Prime Minister. It's the person who holds finance portfolio. And there was a finance de um, a spokesperson's debate last night at the same time the leaders debate was on. And there's a fabulous image in one of the online newspapers, I can't remember which one, of these five men making the economic decisions for us going forward. 
And so I'm just putting a plug out there for all you women who might want to get a career in politics, keep an eye on the economic policy portfolio because we need some gender equity, gender responsive women um, taking up that role. No more comment? Oh, Alicia. I'll go next. Um, look, um, I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to um, uh, talk about this. It's an incredibly important topic. It's one that I know that we all feel passionate about and, um, and want to protect and, um, and nurture, um, which is what women do, isn't it? And, um, and, and just a plug, get your young people out there, make sure they vote. That's really critical. All of them, all genders, doesn't matter. Get them out there um, and, and make sure that they vote. So that, thank you. Charles or Agatha? I'd like to actually invite Agatha to make a final okay. comment on behalf of UPP because really what Jennifer just said rings a bell in terms of a project that Agatha is running and I'm gonna leave her to talk about that as our final word if I may. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Charles. I just wanted to to thank all the uh, the the fellow panelists and the organizers for for having me as as part of this conversation. Uh, it's it's absolutely incredible listening to the New Zealand experience, and both as as UNDP policy specialist, but but also as a um, as as someone from a country that was born in the year when people got the right to vote uh, after almost 50 years of, of communism. Well, they didn't just, just get it. Um, they had to fight for it. Um, and, and I think for the first decade, uh, we knew that democracy was not a given. But then I think here in Poland and countries and in other countries in the region with a similar experience, um, we kind of fell asleep. And, and we didn't know five years ago when, when we got, uh, you know, the populist um, government that's still in place, we, we didn't know who would mobilize. And um, so, um, so, yeah, I think my final comment would be that, you know, democracy is not a given, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a process and it's a practice and it's something that we, we must cherish. And it's, and it's also a culture and it's wonderful uh, to hear how how New Zealand reasserts that right uh, with every election and, and maintains that culture of democratic participation for, for this generation and and the ones to come. Oh, thank you. Um, just thank before you. I hand over to Fiona, I just want to make a personal thank you to the panellists um, for joining us tonight because this whole thing around politics, being also a local government politician, um, it's, it's nice to have this discussion. I kind of live and breathe it um, from a policy space here, but also from, you know, from my own personal life. So um, thank you at, at a personal level. But now, Fiona, I just thought you might like to um, thank everybody from, from Rural Women. Absolutely. So on behalf of Rural Women New Zealand, I'd like to thank all our panellists from across the country and certainly around the globe. I think it's been a really, really interesting uh, conversation tonight and I feel really privileged to be part of this panel. So thank you. And uh, I really like the point you're saying that, you know, we've got to take this voting seriously because it is, it's an important issue that we get out there and make our vote count and that we actually go out there and look for that diversity, look for that change, make sure we're making the right decisions, whatever party that you feel comfortable for, do that, get out there on October the 17th. I mean, actually, if we look at it, it's two days after the International Day of Rural Women. So it's another way to actually celebrate being rural and getting out there and making that vote count for whether it be whether we live rurally, whether it's for gender, however, make that vote count to make our country great and make sure that we're getting the right decisions being made. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all, all our listeners that have been on there tonight. I um, hope you've really enjoyed it. I know this has been recorded and we'll have it up there. Thank you, Angela, and to the team at Rural Women New Zealand at the office uh, for putting this series together. It's not always easy and to get such a high level and such a class uh, panelist together has been a real privilege. So good night, everybody. Kia ora and uh, thank you for being here. Take care. Kia ora. Thank you so Kia much. Ora. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.